here I am, the typical Al-Anon, typical adult child trying to control and fix and, oh, our stepson's not doing good in school. How, you know, how can we make this better? And uh, I was on the phone with my dad during this time. And he, he's always been very good about listening to me, even when I was in the middle of my dysfunction. And he said, that's nice, dear, but what are you doing for you? Well, hello, friends of Bill W. and other friends. You have landed on Sober Speak. My name is John M. I am an alcoholic, and we are glad you are all here, especially newcomers. Newcomers, that is, both to recovery as a whole and newcomers to this podcast. Sober Speak is a podcast about recovery centered around the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. My job here on Sober Speak is simple. My job is to provide a platform to the amazing stories of recovery all around us. Consider Sober Speak, if you will, your meeting between meetings. Please remember, we do not speak for AA or any 12 step community. We represent only ourselves. We are here to share our experience, strength, and hope with those who wish to come along for the ride, take what you want, and leave the rest at the curb for the trash man to pick up. Welcome back, my friends, to the show that never ends. We're so glad you could attend. Come inside, come inside. Greetings from Studio AA Deep in the Heart of Texas. That was Cassandra J. That you heard at the beginning of this here episode number 291. And you're going to hear so much more from Cassandra in just a moment. But first things first, this here episode is being brought to you by Sherry and Lori, and Brad. And what, may you ask, did Sherry and Lori and Brad do? Well, they went to our website, www.soberspeak.com. They clicked on the little yellow donate tab, and they made a contribution. So thank you so much, Sherry and Lori and Brad. This here episode is going right out to you Thank you for helping us keep the virtual lights on here at Sober Speak. So, just so you know, probably a little bit more information than you really need, but uh, this is my second time recording both the introduction to this here episode and the listener feedback that we're going to have. Hopefully, I'll get around to that after this uh, on the end of the episode. And the reason being is because, well, here in the M household, we recently got a new pet. We got a, mm, what's it called? Okay, when you look at the word spelled out, it's uh, it looks like bichapoo, but I think they pronounce it bichapoo. I'm not real, not real sure. I don't know a whole lot about dogs, to tell you the truth. And this is the first pet that I personally have ever had in my life. Now, we do have around the house like some lizards, like a a, uh, what do you call that? A bearded dragon. And my daughters had a chameleon and there was a hamster too that were in the casa. But this is the first dog that I personally have had anything to do with. First pet that I've ever had in my entire life. So we have this uh, Bishapu and uh, her name is Maisie, just in case you're curious. But so Maisie got into the podcast room with me the other day and she's a puppy and she started pulling at all these wires that I have uh, around the, um, anyway, this whole setup I have here, make a, I, I won't bore you with the entire thing, but what happened is, is that the mic fell out of the boom arm that I have it connected to. And it just, it made this big noise. It fell on top of her. She was all freaked out. And, and I was more laughing than anything. It didn't hit her, uh, but she got scared from it. And 
So when she did that, uh, I just put everything back in place and I was here ready to record this weekend. And it turns out that the little power switch got turned off and I did not notice that. So when I say it's the second time, I just recorded everything, but here I am. I love you guys so much. I'm coming back and I'm going to record it. Uno mas tiempo. So here we go. All right. So now we have Miss Cassandra J this week and Cassandra J. This one is called ACA. Adult Children of Alcoholics Anonymous and Dysfunctional Families. And I'm going to put a lot of links in the show notes if uh, you need a little bit more information, or you can just write out to me, uh, to John, J-O-H-N, at SoberSpeak.com, and I'll get you in touch with Cassandra or whoever else we need to get you in touch to if you happen to possibly identify as an adult child. Uh, we discuss on the program the difference between ACA and Al-Anon, uh, the big red book, which is kind of their guiding light within ACA. By the way, every time I heard the big red book, I kept thinking of, you know, Clifford the big red dog is. I don't know why that kept coming to my mind. I don't think the big red dog has anything to do with the big red book, but oh, who knows? It may, I, I haven't done my research on it, but nonetheless, we discussed the big red book, uh, which is kind of like the big book and Alcoholics Anonymous for ACA. We just, we discuss what a recovery date signifies, what it means, what it stands for in ACA. We talk about Cassandra's involvement with this podcast. Yes. Sober speak. Uh, and, uh, I'm forever grateful for everything that she does. Uh, but anyway, we talk about that on the podcast or on the episode, I should say. And then we also talk about emotional sobriety and that ladies and gents is simply the tip of the iceberg. Without further ado, I present to you. Oh, I never noticed that rhymes. Without further ado, I present to you Cassandra J. Enjoy Cassandra, and we will have plenty. Oh, listener feedback at the end of this here episode. Oh, and I know we have plenty of feedback because I've already been through this once. I'm going to go through it again. Anyway, love you guys. Bye. Okay, everybody. So today we have a special guest. I guess they're all special. Uh, but this is someone that I have known for quite some time and I'm looking forward to having her on the podcast here. Her name, well, Cassandra, I'm going to let you go ahead, <laughs> introduce yourself, tell people where you live and why don't you tell them what you're here to talk about today also. Okay. Hi everybody. My name is Cassandra. Um, I am an adult child. So an adult child of an alcoholic. My recovery birthday is July 4th, 2018. And uh, I'm about two hours southwest of the big metroplex in Texas, so I'm in Stephenville. Stephenville, Texas. I know where you are down there in that area. <laughs> Cassandra, by the way, I've been calling you Cassandra for years now, but I think I just heard you say Cassandra. Am I right? Yes, I, I will respond to both. There is no picky particular way. It's They both sound very good to me, and I'm just happy to be uh, spoken to and to be able to speak. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, if I slip and say Cassandra versus Cassandra, it's not on purpose. It's just oh, and I wouldn't notice either way. So. <laughs> All right, Cassandra. All right. So <clears throat> let me explain, just kind of set this up to where, how we know each other. Uh, and then we'll get into the content and what you're here to talk about today. So back in the day, I had 2018 or something like that. I, I, I had no idea what it was. Well, I still don't know what I'm doing, like in certain respects. Uh, and I, I said something on the podcast about if there's somebody out there who is technologically inclined. Uh, do you remember what I said? I have no idea exactly what I said. Yeah, you were reaching out for help because you wanted to start using Instagram and, and start making some other social media posts. And you did say, you know, you're you're not technically inclined and I need somebody to show me how or to help. And I said, me, me, me. So that's yeah, where we yeah, ended so, up. They're right. So you, so, so you reached out and I was like, yeah, let's, 
let's give this a shot. And now, many years later, if, if, if any of you follow us on Instagram, by the way, that's at Soberspeak, mm -hmm. and you see the post on there, I, I don't know, I've put out... I, probably three or four out of the hundreds that are on there. I, I, for the most part, all the good ones are Cassandra. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tried to do something back in the beginning, but I, I don't know. I mean, I, I basically know how you, but you are efficient about it. You put audio clips out there. You put the posts, you do a variety of different things. You, I'm sure know my content Mm -hmm. for sober speak better than any you definitely know it better than me i, I guarantee <laughs> you because you're pulling things out of there and i'm going that was said on the podcast i had no idea uh, well i, I certainly back. can't take all the credit because you you're the one that's doing the interviews and, and bringing all these wonderful speakers on i just get the pleasure of listening and getting the message passed on to me and that's where it all comes from well, you're sweet, and, and I, I appreciate it, and I know we have a lot of followers out there, and then all that stuff gets reposted to Facebook, and mm -hmm. that's reposted to a, a Pinterest as yes. well, at, at Sober Speak there. Isn't that what it is, at Sober I believe Speak? so, I believe, yes. Yeah, and uh, so you can find us there as well, but that's how uh, Cassandra and I know each other, and every time we have a, uh, so we're always going back and forth on text trying to figure out. OK, you know, what do you, you, you know, I'll either ask you for something because I'm completely lost or, or you're asking me <laughs> something because you need permission to do some whatever yep. <laughs> it is. And she also, uh, Cassandra, comes up for all of our, I think you've been to every one. I, yes. I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah. Every one of the Sober Speak live events that we have had. Uh, and that's a, it's about a, we have them at night and I'm always concerned about you getting back. Sometimes you bring a friend, sometimes you don't, uh, but you always drive up here that what, two hours is it? What, yes. Two and a half hours? Yeah about, yeah. about two hours. And it's, you know, I think because I do a lot of driving in the morning and the evening for my, uh, job, it's kind of cathartic and it's time to kind of process and think. So I enjoy getting out of my little small town and coming up to the, uh, big old Metroplex. So <laughs> the big city. <laughs> okay, so this is like, uh, this is just where my mind goes. I'm curious. I noticed a bunch of really pretty paintings mm -hmm. uh, that you have there. What are, are those your paintings? Are they somebody else? Is there some significance behind them? So these are my mom's paintings. My mom was an artist. Um, she used many medium acrylic paint, sculpting, charcoal, pencil, colored pencil. Um, and she has since passed away. She passed away in... Um, 2009. And so these are some of the memories that I have left of her. Um, very bright, vivid, happy memories. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk more about it later. But that's just something that I remember and something that's special to me. And I actually have this one behind me tattooed on my shoulder up here. So. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Wow. That's, and that's a lot of colors, too. That must have it taken uh, a, a bit of time to get that yes. right. Mm -hmm. And so it sure did. It, just out of curiosity, when you get a tattoo like that, does it, mm -hmm. do you have to go back several different sittings or is it in one sitting? How does that work? It depends on what your artist and you decide. I've got a bigger one that's on my leg and that was two sittings, but this painting, and it's just one of the figures. Um, it was one sitting. And so we did the black first and then we went through and did color and kind of bounced around with the various colors. So we weren't hurting too many areas at once. Cool. All right. So let's take a turn here and get into what we're, what we're here to talk about today. So mm -hmm. I wanted to have you on because I've never had anybody from ACA, Adult yes. Children of Alcoholics. Okay. Yes. So the first thing, you gave a date. Mm -hmm. So I know when I'm have when I give a date, it is a what we call sobriety date. And you said your date is July fourth of two thousand eighteen. Correct. Which is oh, which by the way is about the time that we got in contact with each other. So yes. that's very interesting. Okay, <laughs> so how do you come up with a date? What does that mean? What does it signify? Is it different for different people? Tell me about that. 
So I've, and I've heard a lot of people on your um, podcast who, you know, and I just recently, I think it was uh, David's wife who talked about changing her, reco- her sobriety date. Um, and the recovery date in ACA is just a day that we surrendered. It was a day that we got brave and decided to walk away from the fear and the pain um, and the denial of our childhood and face what really happened to us and live a better life, live a, a more free life that's not dictated by fear and control and, um, you know, the the continuing um, denial and and. A spiritual malady that is alcoholism or addiction or just dysfunction in general. Okay, so l- let me back up here a little bit. For those mm-hmm. who may not be familiar with Adult Children of Alcoholics, ACA. Yes. It is a 12-step program, correct? Correct. All right. Yes. Do you, are you able to give a thumbnail sketch of any of the history of it, what it represents, uh, who it's for, and then I, I know that's a lot of things in there, but I also want to know what's the difference between ACA and Al-Anon. Uh, so, so ACA was um, founded in 1978, and it actually formed because of a group of Alateens who were no longer old enough to participate in Al-Anon meetings, um, but needed a safe p- place to continue speaking about the things that happened to them in childhood. And I, I believe a recovering alcoholic by the name of Tony A. Um, linked up with them and began these meetings. And it has traveled all over the United States. It's now all over the world. Um, and the difference between Al-Anon and ACA is, is Al-Anon is more for people who are spouses or direct family members of alcoholics, um, which I certainly am, but adult children of alcoholics allows you to focus on what happened to you in childhood that brought you to this point that maybe um, contributed to you marrying an alcoholic, marrying an addict, um, you know, contributed to you being an alcoholic or an addict. Um, And so we get to the root of those problems and get to discuss what that was like, what those experiences were like. So there's a book, I believe, Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm pretty sure I read it when I first got sober. Uh, And it's called Adult Children of Alcoholics. So is that somehow related to the program? Is that some sort of guide or talk to me? So that's not necessarily conference approved literature like you would find in Al-Anon or AA or NA, um, but it does discuss a lot of the things that contribute to what is known as being an adult child of alcoholics. Um, And I actually have my conference approved literature here and it is quite massive. (laughs) Yeah. It's, it's a big, you know, it's, it's our book. It, It talks about how to create meetings and, you know, uh, backstory, the 12 steps. It's got all that information in there, but I believe I remember the book that you're talking about and it's got a very specific design on the front of it. I think, Uh um, my dad had that when I was growing up, my father's in recovery himself. And so I know the book that you're talking about, but same ideas. It's just not conference approved literature. Understood. So that book that I got back in the the early nineties, Mm-hmm. and read i got it from barnes and noble or whatever they had at that time i see i've, I've thought this whole time that is the guide for uh alcoholic excuse me uh, adult children of alcoholics however you're saying somebody else wrote a book mm-hmm. and who wrote the book for adult the the approved adult children and is it called adult children of alcoholics so it's called Adult Children of Alcoholics or Dysfunctional Families. That is the big broad term that our program uses. Um, and it's just, it was a group of ACAs um, and recovering adult children that uh, got together and created it much like um, the AA Big Book. It's just stories, the steps, you know, what the program should look like. Um, and I don't have an exact date when it was written and published, but right. it's the same stuff. It's just it's our holy grail, so to speak. Understood. And are there any significant differences that you can think of between the ACA steps and the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous or Al-Anon? So in AA and Al-Anon and NA, you're, you're focusing on your behavior, your resentments, your fears, your spiritual malady, 
And adult children get to look at our parents. We get to look at the people who we who were raised us um, because in essence, we had become those people. You know, we swear up and down, I'm never going to be like my mom. I'm never going to be like my dad. But we became those people um, because we are alcoholics without taking the drink. And so we get to look at our parents' behavior in, con- in conjunction with our own. And we also get to evaluate our trauma. So there's there's people who are physically abused, sexually abused. Um, I know of somebody who was in and out of the foster system who's a member of this program. We get to look at the our childhood. And we're not blaming it on our childhood, but we need to see clearly our childhood in order to understand why we became the way we did. So when I read that book, Adult Children of Alcoholics Anonymous, way back when, I remember the guy who suggested that I read it. Well, my mom was not an alcoholic, but she dealt with some severe mental illness. And the reason I say that is is because it would be naive of me to think that what I went through with my mom growing up did not or does not affect me in some form or fashion. And what I hear you saying is that it's similar in ACA, like you're going back and you're looking at it and saying, hey, I'm not blaming anybody, but Mm -hmm. let's look at how this affected me and 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 um, uh, how it affects my choices moving forward. Yes. Um, So, okay. The other thing I want to know about the book it's, it's the big red book. Do, do yes. I, I see. And the only reason I know this is because you're holding it up. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what is it? Is it known? As, you know, like like Alcoholics Anonymous is known as the big book. Do mm-hmm. they call it like the big red book or is yep. there any sort of nick, nickname? That's what we call it. We call it the big red book. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> well, good, good. Luck well, of the draw. Nope. Yeah, don't ever change the color of it because no. it throws people off. <laughs> All right, so in the big red book, uh, is it set up similar? I know you said there's stories like in the back, and mm-hmm. then it talked about the steps. And it, it, is it very? Uh, is it like the first part of it is how to work the program, much like Alcoholics Anonymous, and then in the in the back of it is just the various uh, stories that you have. So the front of it um, explains our plight what an adult child is, what a para-alcoholic is, what codependency is. The middle of the book is the steps, and there's usually always a story or several stories that go along with the steps. And the back of the book follows up with the traditions, the concepts, how to start a meeting, where to locate an adult child meeting. Um, And so it's just like a complete user manual of here's your recovery and how to start a meeting and how to keep the meetings going and how to be of service. And um, it's it's incredible. And I've been through it. I've read it probably eight or nine times now. And I always find something in there that I didn't connect with before, Um, you know, and and the stories. Yes, you've heard them several times, but they mean different things when you read them again, Um, you know, and. uh, Sometimes it's overwhelming. There's a lot of emotional work that goes into this this program. Let's step back again, and, and I, I want to ask you what was going on before you got here, and what prompted your entree uh, into ACA. So um, I am no stranger to 12-step programs. I was raised in Alcoholics Anonymous, just about. Uh, my father uh, was sober in 2001. Um, and would take me to his meetings, would take me to the park and read the big book. Those are some very, very fond memories I have. Um, and he has maintained oh, his he recovery. He would take you to the park and read the big book, huh? Yep, he would. He would swing, push me on the swing, and then he would go sit down and read a little bit, and then he would come play with me again, and then he would go read again. Um, wow. So we're no stranger to recovery, and my father continued his journey. And in fact, um, my mother was in her own recovery program later in my teenage years. Um, My brother is also no stranger to recovery and and had um, some time in the programs as well. Um, So I was raised on a foundation of recovery and uh, eight years later, my mom died and I ran essentially, you know, it was how I coped, but I moved away. I moved here to Texas to uh, follow my fiance. I was in Las Vegas. I was raised in Las Vegas, Nevada. Oh yeah, that's right. 
And so I followed him down here, ended you up leaving your him. Was yes. he here already? Yes, he had moved down shortly after high school. So we were high school sweethearts. Um, long story short, I ended up leaving him and I'm now married to this other man um, who divorced his first wife, who was an addict um, and still, you know, struggles a little bit. And here I am. The typical Al-Anon, typical adult child trying to control and fix and, oh, our stepson's not doing good in school. How, you know, how can we make this better? And uh, I was on the phone with my dad during this time. And he he's always been very good about listening to me, even when I was in the middle of my dysfunction. And he said, that's nice, dear, but what are you doing for you? And I, it suddenly it clicked and I was like, oh, oh, yeah, huh? <laughs> So I got off the phone with him and typed in adult children of alcoholics. I think I was looking for Al-Anon, um, but somehow I was led to adult children of alcoholics. And so the next day I got in the car, it was the 4th of July, and I drove up to um, the Harbor House and went to my first ACA meeting. Is the Harbor House, what is, is that like a meeting place? Yes. What is that? It's, it's a little recovery center and they hold meetings of all sorts. So they've got CODA and AA and I believe they have NA up there. Um, right. Like a club. Yes. I think. Okay. So, so that was one of my other questions about this, uh, the meetings mm -hmm. like, you know, up here where, where I live, if you're trying to find an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, you know, you can you you can throw a stick or whatever one of those things is and you can find one pretty easy. I don't hear about many ACA meetings up here. Yes. Uh, do you, are they plentiful and I just don't know about it or? So they exist. Yes. So if you need to locate an adult children of alcoholics uh, meeting, you go to adultchildren.org. Um, or you can go to our inner group website, um, website, N E T X A C A. So Northeast Texas ACA.org. Um, there are several meetings up there. Um, there's meetings in Denton. I think we have meetings all the way East as far as Atlanta, Texas. Um, and our inner group has also absorbed the meetings that are in the panhandle of Texas as well. In Stephenville, our group is the farthest south group for our inner group. Um, but yeah, I just typed in adult children of alcoholics meeting and there they were. Are there, are there many men in the meetings? So there are, there are men in the meetings and there are women too. Um, our group has, uh, so when we started, our group grew and it was such a blessing. We, you know, we filled all the chairs in our little room. And, and I want you to imagine this small little room attached to an AA clubhouse here in our town. Um, and so I think at some point we had, you know, up to 15 people. And, and I would say a good portion of them were men, at least half of them were men. Um, and so our group now, we're smaller still, but we still, there's still men in our group, yes. Do y'all ever have like, uh, like, you know, in AA, there's like conventions and stuff like that. Do you have larger get togethers? So it is my understanding that those larger get togethers did exist before COVID. Um, and they still exist, except I think they're virtual now. Um, I am a part of our inner group here in the Northeast Texas area. And um, we are creating and hoping to put together a convention for September. Um, but we're still working on the details of getting that off the ground, like funding and you know, where we're going to hold it and how we're going to get the word out. So. Okay. So let's go back to your personal story a little bit then. All right. Um, so you were in the midst of, like you said, trying to control things and make things work out the way you wanted to work. It, oh, and the other thing I want to ask you, so what attracted you to, to sober speak, if you will, I, you know, because are there ACA podcasts out there? Uh, talk to me about why you were drawn to sober speak, you know, alcoholics in general. I'm, I guess it's because of your dad and your yes. upbringing there. Uh, but yep. talk to me about that. So, you know, um, well, I was drawn to the podcast to begin with because I, I drive. 
I have quite a drive before I get to my job in the morning and quite a drive after my job in the evening. And I was going to meetings up in Fort Worth too. Um, and in my local area, like Weatherford and that's kind of a drive. It's 30, 40 minutes. And so I really wanted some recovery to keep in my brain while I was making this drive. And so I just, you know, typed in sobriety podcast and here came sober speak. And I was like, this is great. <laughs> I can relate so much to everybody that's on there, but I definitely relate to the alcoholics because I myself am, am alcoholic mentally in the way I think and feel and act, but I don't pick up the drink. I've, you know, I don't drink alcoholically. I've never done drugs. I just have the mental obsessions and, and the spiritual malady that alcoholics have. Do you remember Billy Kay being on? The, yes. Yeah. So she she talked about a little bit about that phenomena, and I can't explain it as eloquently as she does, but she said the physical allergy for her, and by the way, for those who haven't heard it, she is a, a member of Al-Anon. Uh, she said the physical allergy for her was basically the the addiction to the adrenaline. Mm-hmm. Uh, that she would get from trying to, you know, control the mess or make the mess or, you know. Yes. And so that reminds me of what you're talking about right now is a, even though you're not picking up the drink, mm -hmm. uh, you, you have, have a lot of the same behaviors. Yes. And once again, that goes back to being and at least as one of the contributors, right? I guess nobody ever really knows, but one of the contributors is probably being an adult child of uh, an alcoholic uh, in, yes. and uh, seeing what you saw growing up. Okay. Yes. Okay. So I, I, uh, my apologies. I keep going off on these tangents as I think <laughs> this is not normal for me, as you know, right? It's just not, it's not a traditional kind of, you know, AA 12 step or Al Anon, yes. and, and, and I keep coming, I just keep thinking of different things. So that's great. Uh, I'm here to answer for, them. <laughs> good. Well, thanks for bearing with me because I got a feeling the things that I'm thinking about, uh, or, you know, maybe coming up as questions in other people's mind as well. Mm -hmm. Back to you and your story and your recovery. So you get, so you're going through this kind of controlling phase and realize, oh, I'm doing the same things again, and this is not working out well. Yes. And then you find an, an ACA meeting almost by accident. You think yep. you're, you think you're trying to find like a, uh, an Al-Anon meeting or something like that. Probably didn't know exactly what you were looking for, but you needed help, right? Yes. All right. So you go into the meeting and I mean, kind of take me from there, your personal story. Well, I remember being absolutely terrified on the drive up there. I remember being absolutely terrified sitting down that day. And it was just, it was just a couple of people, um, no more than a handful, but we just, they, they sat and they read from this, this book, this big red book. Um, and the part, and this is where my higher power comes in. The part that we were reading talks about how this disease impacts our children, even without us realizing it. And I was overcome with just this guilt and this, this sadness, you know, for my stepson, because he had exposure to this disease before I even came into the picture. And when I came into the picture, even though I'm not technically an alcoholic or an addict, I still contributed to the dysfunction that, um, continues and it was just overwhelming. So I drove back to Stephenville. I found an Al-Anon meeting here in town and that's where I met my sponsor. Um, and I'm like, Hey, you've got to check out these ACA meetings. These are great. <laughs> and so she would drive with me back and forth. And we eventually decided, you know, this is something we need to bring closer to us. Uh, the drive is not always feasible. Um, I work in education and so I have time in the summer, but I can't always commit to driving up to Fort Worth on a weekday, so to speak. And it took us, it took us a couple months and in the beginning of 2019, so in February 2019, we had gone to um, the AA building here in town to their group conscience and asked if we could please use their room. And we created our, our little group here in Stephenville and it flourished and it, it has maintained since then. Um, 
And so I have a place that I can go and share my story and listen to others and to not feel that chronic uniqueness that sometimes alcoholics talk about. Um, and the bigger blessing is that my father and my, my stepmom are members of this program as well. And they came to visit me last week and I got to take them to where I have my meetings. They got to sit in a meeting with me, oh. you know, as a family. And that is just a sheer blessing of our higher power and the strength and power of this program. Oh, that's very nice. Let's talk about the first step within ACA and what that means to you. Can you share with me a little bit about that? And, yeah. and, and by the way, what, what does the step say? We came, there were powerless over what? Yeah. So step one, and we have um, other variations of the steps, but these are the, the formally adopted ones. We admitted we were powerless over the effects of alcohol or other family dysfunction and that our lives had become unmanageable. Um, and so the effects of alcohol or other family dysfunctions. Yes. Okay. So what does that mean to you? It means the way I'm acting is based out of fear. It's based out of my environment as a childhood and the way I survived my childhood does not allow me to survive being an adult. And I'm powerless over how this disease comes out in the way I think and feel and act. Um, and I just, I can't manage myself, let alone anybody else, if this disease is left untreated. Can you give me an example of how that manifests itself in your life? Um, so... One of the traits of an adult child is that we um, are afraid of authority figures. And I was chronically afraid of being making a mistake and getting in trouble. So um, I would try to be perfect and act perfect and be helpful and spread myself thin to where I took advantage of myself and I would get burnt out and I would blow up and the cycle would repeat itself. I get that. It's so, and it's very interesting because like, <laughs> I, I'm laughing because, you know, when I'm interviewing the alcoholics, they're always like, you know, they, they thumb their nose at authority. Uh, and it's kind of the opposite. I mean, they both cause issues yes. and they both have their downsides. Uh, and, and, you know, I guess the, what it, what a healthy person would do is just have a healthy respect for the authority. Yet, but you know, uh, it, it's balanced, uh, mm -hmm. and I guess that's where we're all trying to get to. Yes. What does step four say? Is it exactly as it is written in the in the big book, or is there some sort of variation on it? So step four, essentially, yes, we look at ourselves, and yes, we look at our behavior. Um, however we get to look at our parents' behavior. We get to look at the things that they did, the things that we were exposed to, and how that impacts us. So there's a big, there's several more lists and columns in ACA compared to AA. So it's, oh, you know, no. who, who am I angry at? Why am I angry at them? What does that impact? Um, in myself and like what, you know, what are my character defects essentially in AA, but in ACA, we kind of, in a way, get to take inventory of our parents. What did my parents do? How did they act? How did they behave? How did that impact me? And then you kind of look at, okay, I became um, a control freak. I became resentful because of the things you know, that my mother or my father did, or, you know, whoever it was that raised you. Um, you know, there's, there's an inventory list for sexual abuse. Um, there's a, a list for PTSD and trauma. It can be kind of overwhelming. You get something else a little bit more. Do you notice people getting pretty emotional and, or, going places where perhaps they did not expect to go during their fourth and fifth step? I think it just depends on where you are in your process. If you had asked me four years ago when I 
almost five when I got into this program, what my childhood was like, I would have told you it was great. I had food. I had a roof over my head. Um, I went to school. I had both my parents. I had my brother. But I know better now, and I can tell you what was happening behind closed doors in my house now. And I'm, I, it's no secret, and, and I'm not ashamed to share it. Um, it was traumatic. I was a lost child who was ignored, whose parents were caught up in their own dysfunction, their own disease. They had an older child who became dysfunctional and whose disease manifested in, in mental health aspects. And they were so fixated on that that I did not exist. And I thought that being the perfect child, going to school, getting better grades, staying quiet, being good, not getting in trouble was the way to go. And it left me feeling empty. So while we take a thorough and fearless moral inventory of ourselves, you know, that, that's what the step says. There's more to it. There's more work to be done. You get to look at your parents and their behavior. You get to look at the things that happen to you. So help me understand this then um, I, uh, from an ACA perspective. So I get mm -hmm. it that you take that inventory and you're able to look at your parents and I'm assuming other authority figures if need be, right? To yes. some people raised by people who aren't their parents and all that sort of stuff. But if you take that inventory and you look at it and then you break it down, what is the... Where's the end result? Like you said earlier, when we first started this, it's not about blaming them. Mm -hmm. um, is it about that awareness? And once you have that awareness, you can change some of that behavior like control or whatever it may be. And is it kind of a, uh, a, a is it God centered as well? Like in other words, like an AA, we talk a lot about how, yeah, you can recognize that, but you need God or something outside of you to help you make that change because I can't do it on my own. Yes, yes. And, and the steps are very similar. You know, two came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Three made a decision to turn our will and lives over to the care of God as we understand God or your own higher power, the spirit of the universe, whatever you want to call it. Um, but the goal is to change our behavior. The goal is to right our wrongs, you know, make our amends because that's still a part of our process, but also understand for example, if I can't manage money, you know, did I see that as an example as a child? Now I understand how it was passed down, but I need to work on that. You know, I need to surrender that to God and allow my higher power to come in and, you know, work in my life so that I can be a responsible, functioning adult, a happy right. one. So you've been in for five years now. If you were to put a bow on this and talk about what the program has done for you. How would you describe that? And then also think about this in terms of sharing your per, your personal experience, strength and hope where this is concerned and what it may or may not do out there for somebody who is looking to find uh, another methodology for changing their life. This program has allowed me to heal that little girl that I just talked about, the little girl who was lost, who wasn't nurtured, who wasn't loved, who wasn't paid attention to. It's allowed me to reparent myself and to be the person that says, okay, you made a mistake. How are we going to fix it instead of shaming and blaming? Um, you know, this program has allowed me to live life on life's terms, to be okay with the good and the bad. Um, to pause before I think, say, and do, to apologize right away when I've, when I've done something off color. Um, this program has brought me peace and serenity. I don't have to live in fear. I don't have to control. I don't have to shame or blame myself or, or others. Um, I don't have to hold myself to unrealistic expectations. I can finally be free and I can finally talk about what happened to me. Trust that the feelings and the memories that I'm remembering are valid and are true um, and feel my feelings when they come up where I was never allowed to talk, trust, or feel as a child. I am, I am finally free and I have emotional sobriety. You have found an avenue to help you with all that you just talked about, which is fantastic. I know a lot of people go to, did you ever try like, counseling? Did it, did it work? And what's the difference between counseling and this? So 
Therapy allows me to talk about the stuff that I can't necessarily talk about. And I'm doing therapy finally now, but it allows me to talk about the stuff that I can't talk about in the meeting. So for example, if somebody was physically abused, if somebody was sexually abused, if someone experienced sexual misconduct, that's not something that you necessarily want to bring up in a, in a meeting room and trigger everyone else around you. But, um, I'm, I'm, a, the meeting allows me to share that experience and to share my growth with people and to learn, you know, how others are handling similar experiences and the therapy allows me to work through that at a little deeper level and to feel and have a safe place to, to cry and to process and to be angry if need be. Um, but it's, and our, our literature will talk about it. It's in conjunction to, we suggest therapy, but you all, we also suggest, you know, going to meetings and getting a sponsor and working the steps and being of service similar to what you would hear in the, in another program. It's just a missing link that helps heal deeper pain. There's various tools uh, and every, it, it, what I keep thinking of this whole entire time is, you know, I'm glad Cassandra found her tribe uh, and uh, everyone's, you know, the, it's, it's not the same tribe for everybody. Obviously God ordained for you to get in uh, uh, ACA, and I, I'm real glad you did. I'm sure your family is glad you did. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the people you work with most likely are glad you did, <laughs> and uh, that's fantastic. All right, Cassandra. Well, listen, is there anything else you want to share before we close it out here? Just that it gets better. Anything that you have been through, you know, anything that you're going through, it gets better. And there, there are people there to support you, um, and to help you, um, you know, alcoholism is cunning, baffling and per powerful and, um, it's pervasive and it impacts so many lives that, you know, it's hard to find somebody that's maybe an average person these days. Um, so just because you don't drink, you know, doesn't mean that there's not a place for you. You know, th there is hope. There is a place to recover. Amen, Sister Cassandra. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you know, uh, oh, I got to go get my book. Hold on just a second. Okay. <laughs> there you go. I mean, it wasn't too far away. It was right there, but I need to get my book. When I say the book, this is the little, well, the, the little blue book for me. Uh, yeah, yeah. You I have one too, book. yes. I have and a little a, little book too. Yeah. <laughs> and I've got a small version of the big book here. Page 164. It says, abandon yourself to God as you, under, as you understand God. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit, and you will surely meet some of us, like me and Cassandra, not Cassandra, as you trudge the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then. Thank you so much, Cassandra. I so much appreciate you coming on. And I thank you. John. And I am uh, eternally grateful for all the hard work that you put into helping us to spread the message here at Sober Speak through all the posts and, and, you, and you've done all sorts of things throughout the years. And I'm, I just, God bless you. Thank you for all your service work. Uh, it means the world to me. And I'm so glad that God brought you into my life. I'm just grateful to give back to the program that saved my family when I was a little girl. So thank you, John. Um, Thanks for allowing me to be of service. You're sweet. All right. Goodbye, Cassandra. Bye. Once again, Cassandra J., thank you for coming on the podcast and recording an episode. And if you are out there and you're thinking, I may identify as an adult child, we're going to have, once again, plenty of links in the show notes. You can go click on that or just reach out to me, John, J-O-H-N, at SoberSpeak.com, and we will get you in touch with Cassandra or um, whoever else we need to get you in touch with. If you don't sound crazy. Just don't sound crazy, right? That's the first step in good communication. Don't sound crazy. <laughs> uh, anyway, I digress. All right. Now on to a little bit. Oh, 
uh, what is this? Listener feedback. Now, oh, by the way, remember, we do not want you sharing your gossip or an STD, but we would love for you to share this episode with a friend or family member. It may be just what they need today. Just pause your little device, whatever you're on. I don't know. It could be big, little, big. I don't know. Uh, pause your device. Click that little share button and send it over to the friend or family member. We sure would appreciate that. Now, on to a little bit of listener feedback. Lori writes in and she says, Hi, John. Thank you for Sober Speak. I love, love, love your podcast. I'm sober for over a year now and found your podcast early on. I look forward to each weekly new episode and I'm episode and I'm currently listening to the quote top episodes unquote on your website. You are my meeting between meetings and I'm grateful. What she's talking about there is if you go to our website and you click on the tab at the top called top episodes that will give you an idea of the most, well, it doesn't give you an idea. It actually tells you these are the most listened to we, uh, uh, episodes throughout the years. And you can use that as a guiding light to get you started with uh, guiding light. That doesn't sound right, does it? Uh, it, it can, um, uh, I'm not coming up with the word right now. So, but anyway, it'll get you jump started with uh, the Sober Speak podcast, uh, just in case you don't know where to start. Anyway, Lori goes on and she says, please let me know. Oh, please know that what you are doing, John, is making a positive difference in my life and surely many, many more wishing you continued success. Lori E. God bless you, Lori. Thank you for letting us here at the podcast be a small part of your journey. Um, it really is cool when I get these various emails and messages and such. Uh, it's, uh, it's what keeps me keeping on. It surely is. Uh, you know, and I don't need a big pat on the back every day, but it is, it's nice to know that there are people out there listening and they are gaining some sort of insight from it, especially the speakers that I bring in and the guests. And, um, thank you for writing in Lori and congratulations on your year sobriety. Kirsten writes in and she says, hi, John M. My pleasure. <laughs> so here's the deal. Uh, 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 Kirsten had written in with a, a contribution and I just sent her a little thank you. And she wrote back and she says, hi, John M. My pleasure on the contribution. <laughs> And she spells it all out. You know, I don't know exactly how you spell that word when I'm pronouncing it, but I, Kirsten, I think you did a fantastic job. Anyway, Kirsten says, I am in upstate New York near Woodstock. I grew up in Kentucky, San Francisco, California, uh, London, uh, England, and New York. And I moved here from New York City before the pandemic. Well, you've been around there. She says, I have been sober for coming up on 27 years in July. Good for you, Carson. And, and I was and still am into the sober network in New York City. Uh, I'm a cellist and an accountant. Well, I bet you don't see that uh, combo very often there, uh, Kirsten, but that is fantastic. And many of my wildest dreams have come true. I was an IV drug user, which is what brought me in. Uh, who would have thought a classical cellist from Kentucky would do that? <laughs> I am in DA Al-Anon and I dabble in many other 12-step programs. DA Drugs Anonymous. I'm sorry, I'm not familiar. I'm, I'm, you know, I, I could probably do a little research before I started here, but I, I forgot that was in there. Anyway, DA. I'm sure, I'm sure it's one of the anonymous programs. Anyway, she says I have been listening to you since mid-pandemic, and I have found it very enlightening. 
I'll have to look back at your episodes to see what I like the best, but I think Katie is her name, who was on recently the ex-athlete and model. I could relate to her story. Yeah, that's Katie T. She says, do you have any good Zoom meetings you can recommend? And then she says, I book a Zoom New York City AA meeting on Monday nights at 645 Eastern. Uh, If you ever want to speak or know of someone that can, thanks. Well, Okay, a couple of questions there. Do you have a good Zoom meeting you can recommend? Well, I wrote back to Kirsten and I just said, listen, I don't attend many Zoom meetings anymore, but if you if you get in the Super Secret Facebook group and you ask that question, you'll probably get more feedback than you ever wanted. Uh, there's a lot of good people uh, in that group and they attend Zoom meetings and they can give you some recommendation. And then the other part about if I'd ever be able to speak, I, as you know, I wrote you back. We're working on something to kind of work out our time where it works into my schedule and yours. Uh, yes, I'm available. Uh, and here's the other thing I want to say is that there are a lot of people out there that are looking for speakers, either for their conferences uh, in person or for their Zoom meetings. And I have a list of people that I can provide to you um, that have all been on the podcast. Just write me at John, J-O-H-N at SoberSpeak.com and we can get you their email addresses. Or if there's somebody in particular you were after, um, go ahead and write me and we can get you their info and hopefully they can uh, appear at your Zoom meeting and or your conference. Thanks, Kirsten. Karen writes in and she says, Hi, John. First, I just want to thank you for your service. I love, in big capital letters, your podcast so much. I look forward to Fridays to hear the new one. I am nine months sober and I have learned so much from your meeting between meetings. Big smiley face. Secondly, I am chairing my home group for the first time in a few in a few weeks, and Marty C agreed to speak. I am so excited! <laughs> a couple exclamation points. She sir, she says I heard his stories on your podcast, and I told my sponsor I was going to attend his home group and ask him. And wow, she had his number. He is not too far from my area. I am giddy like a schoolgirl. He he. <laughs> I'm glad you got Marty and he is fantastic, man. Uh, that is quite a score there. Uh, I'm glad you're able to get him come speak at your group. And she says, thirdly, Oh, this is something that's in the past. So I'm not going to read it. Uh, and, uh, then she talks about sponsorship. She said, I would assume Oh, she says, I have tried to sponsor two women. I enjoyed it very much, but I lost both of them as one picked up again and the other decided she didn't want to work the steps. Erg. It's very hard not to feel sad about this, but I have a great sponsor and she helped me with everything. I want to be ready when God puts someone into my life to work with. It helps me too. Big smiley face. She's Karen A., a fan from Brantford, Ontario. Put the big Canadian flag there. Well, good to hear from you. One of the Canucks up there. Isn't it? A Canuck is a Canadian, right? I've been through this before on the podcast, I know. But nonetheless, Karen A., thanks for writing in. And I'm glad you got Marty to, to share with you there. And that sponsorship thing will work out, I guarantee you. Like, in other words, anyone who's been around for any length of time sponsoring quite a few folks, I will tell you, you win some, you lose some, some get rained out, and uh, it's just about doing the work and doing uh, the next right thing. And uh, But anyway, I'm glad you're going through all that experience. Thanks for writing in, Karen A. Johnny writes in, he says, hey, John, this is Johnny M. in Chicago. I hope you remember me. Yes, sir, Mr. Johnny, I remember you. He says, two years ago this past February, I discovered your podcast and the talks of Gary Kay, who you helped me connect with. I'm so, so grateful to report that I celebrated two years of sobriety on February 14th, and I am living my best life. I'm connected to a higher power uh, that I was asleep to at one point. I still follow you and just listen to Ricky R's sponsorship share this morning. I absolutely loved it. 
I'm reaching out because a young man from the Dallas area is looking to get connected to some AAs. A mutual friend of his and his parents reach out to me. I'm hoping you can help. Please reach back with any thoughts. As always, you can call me anytime in forever gratitude. Your brother, your friend and brother in the greatest thing going, Johnny. Well, as you know, Johnny, I responded. Uh, we got Gary K and Ricky R on the email as well, and we will get this young man, I'm assuming he's young. I don't know. You talked about his parents and such. Um, I, he could just be, he, he could be 70 with 90 year old parents. Who knows? But nonetheless, uh, we'll try to get him hooked up as soon as we possibly can. Just uh, uh, copy him on the email and we will uh, do the good work of Alcoholics Anonymous for this gent. Finally, at least but not least, Calvin writes in. He says, hey, John, I would like to first of all, thank you for the podcast. It really helps me on my bad days at work to recenter myself. I would also like to thank you because unbeknownst to you, you would help me get the sponsor who helped change my life. You may or may not remember a year ago, a man named Derek C. I know Derek. Yes. Who reached out to you looking for sponsorship. You ended up getting him hooked up with Gary K. Well, Derek was sober for 12 years. And guess what? He had never sponsored anyway. He was afraid that they, the sponsees would go back out and he would blame himself. And Gary told him, we don't do that. Pray for a sponsee. The very next day, the sponsor I had fired me. And because Derek took me out for a cup of coffee the week before, I knew I was going to ask him. Well, I had been struggling a bit at that time and I was in and out, but I knew I wanted this thing. Somehow Derek ended up being the best possible sponsor for me. And I have now been sober since July 23rd of 2022. Good for you, Calvin. Not a whole lot of time, but Derek helped me a lot along the way and indirectly you have as well once again i want to thank you much love man calvin well calvin good for you that is fantastic you and derek c i know he's got his nickname there i'm using his uh I'm just trying to protect his anonymity and you're, you're going to know what it means when you're listening to this. But, uh, uh, yes, I know who Derek is. I know who Gary is. Uh, and now I know you as well, uh, uh, Calvin. So God bless you. Keep me posted. All right, everybody. That thar is another week of sober speak in the can. And, um, what else did I want to say? Keep coming back. It works if you work it. May God bless you and keep you until then. I take this a week at a time. Hope to be back next week. God bless y'all. Love you. Thank you for listening in. And uh, may God bless you. Keep you until then. Bye-bye.